Hi, this is Annika from Looker. Today I'm going to show you how to get started deploying Looker in your organization by connecting a new database, generating and customizing a reusable data model, exploring the data through that model, and then sharing my new findings. The first step to exploring our data in Looker is going to be to connect a database. Here I'm looking at the Admin Connections section, where I can see a variety of different databases that have already been connected, or add a new one. Looker connects exclusively via JDBC and writes SQL queries to databases. The complete list of dialects to which Looker can connect is available here. Um, you'll notice this includes both relational and non-relational sources. For example, if we look at Google Sheets or something like Spark SQL, this is an ever-expanding list as well. Once we've connected a database, we're ready to generate our first model. I'll go to Develop and select Manage Lookamall Projects, and from here I'm going to create a brand new project. A project is something that's going to stick with us. It's something that my coworkers and I are going to build business logic into that we'll collaborate on. It's going to be version controlled, and it's also going to serve as a single source of business truth for any end users or technical users who might interact with Looker in the future. So let's just call this e-commerce, since it's an e-commerce data set. I'll point it to our demo new events data set. And I'm just going to generate all of the tables in here for now. I can also choose to select a single table or select schemas. What Looker's doing as I'm generating this is scanning through all of the different tables and columns that exist on this database connection. So if we click into order items, for example, we can see that it's found an ID column, it's found an inventory items column, it's also found some timestamps and is automatically breaking these out into a number of different time frames. These are going to be very flexible for me to use and I'm not going to have to remember how to get a date or a quarter out of a timestamp anymore. In addition to all the columns in the database innately, it's also generated one aggregate for me, account star. If we look at the model file, Looker's also gone through and identified some relationships between tables. This should save me a lot of time writing joins, even if I need to specify some changes to some of these, maybe users needs to be joined on a different key or additional conditions need to go into here. Everything we're looking at, whether it's in individual tables or in the model file, is completely customizable. And then the logic I define here will be shared across others who interact with the data model. So before we start modifying anything here, let's jump to the explore section. To begin interacting with this data, I'll click Explore and select which table I want to start writing queries from. In this case, let's talk about order items. So I'll click that and it'll open up the Explore page for me. The Explore page is where analysts and developers and anyone who's interacting with the data is going to be able to curate their own questions and interact in real time. The fields that we're seeing up here on the left are just the initial generation. We're going to customize and curate what we see here, but as we can recognize from the order items table, there's an inventory item ID, ID, sale price, this count that we talked about, as well as the di different time frames that came through the timestamp. So let's write a simple query. Let's start out just by selecting count. This is an aggregate, as we can see, it's under the measures section instead of the dimensions section, which are non-aggregates. If I want to see the SQL that's about to be generated to my database, I can click the SQL tab here. This allows me to validate any reports that I might generate in Looker against my existing reports. I should be able to find any discrepancies and track them down to their source. So let's click Run. And when I click Run here, Looker's directly interacting with my database and running that query. We can see it just returned one row, taking 0.2 seconds. Let's start to break this out by more things. So let's group this out by date, and let's jump back to the SQL tab. What we can see is happening here is it's taking the raw order items created at timestamp, it's running a convert time zone function on that, which I would have specified on the database connection, and then running a date function. Looker already knows how to generate different time frames for a number of database dialects. You won't need to customize these and just build in the logic for everyone to reuse. Let's also add a filter. So let's look at 30 days and give this a run. Switching back to the results tab, I can click on any of these headers to sort the order that these results will appear in, and then I can start popping open my first visualization. Keep in mind we haven't done anything to customize yet, this is just what we're getting straight out of the database. Without needing to export any of my data, I can quickly toggle through a number of different visualizations. And if I so choose, I can even import my own custom JavaScript visualizations to make available to all of my users. Next, let's add a pivot. Pivoting is something commonly done in Excel, but often really tricky to get directly out of a database. In this case, I want to see what status my different order items are in. So I'll click pivot here, and we'll see the distinct values of the status column appear across the top and then appear as nice series in my visualization. Let's stack these on top of each other to make them a little bit more readable. 
Now, everything I'm seeing here is interactive. So for example, if I don't care about canceled orders, I can just toggle that out of this visualization, or I can quickly and easily add another filter to remove that from the query altogether. So maybe I want to start interacting with this a little bit more. For example, if I'm wondering about some of these orders that shipped all the way back on the 2nd of February, I can click on that and I can see what those individual orders are. We'll also notice that I have an option to drill into a smaller time frame. Because I use this date timestamp, by default, smaller time frames like time are being made available for me to drill into. We can see that these are the 10 orders that haven't been made available yet, and this isn't telling me a ton about why those aren't available. So let's explore a little bit more. Why don't we look at the distribution center that these came from? something automatically generated here. And let's also add in the state that they're being shipped to. This might tell us a little bit more about why those orders haven't been delivered yet. From this table, we can see a lot of these are having to go all the way across the country, and perhaps that's why they're taking longer to ship. If I wanna share this with somebody else who can then make a change to our operations around where orders get shipped from, from distribution centers, I can just grab this URL and send it to my coworker, who's gonna be able to then take this and make action upon it. They'll jump right into my context. They'll be able to alter statuses. So for example, if they wanna see also processing orders that haven't been delivered yet, they can alter the filters that I've jumped them into. As we can see here, because everything is coming straight out of the database, I haven't lost any granularity and I can continue to add ad hoc questions that I might wanna interact with here. Let's jump back to our visualization we created. Besides just sharing the URL, I have a few other options to get this in front of other people. If this is something that I just need to send to somebody as a one-off and I don't really care about them getting access to it again, I can just download a text file, a CSV, Excel, even a PNG of the image itself. This allows me to just quickly get the data in front of somebody even if they don't have a Looker login. Now if I want to do this on a regular basis, I can also start to schedule it out. So let's save this piece of content. I'm clicking Save as Look. We'll call this orders by status, and I'll just save this into my own personal workspace. Having saved this piece of content, this look has its own page. On here, I can alter filters that have been placed. I can see the underlying data or even the SQL that's under this overall query. Or I can also start scheduling it out. So let's click Create Schedule. I'll select that I want this to run once a week, and let's have this go out on Mondays to my executive team. This email will now appear in their inbox, and I can select whether I want this to go out as a table, as a CSV, as a JSON, as an inline visualization. And I can also determine I don't want this to go as an email, but instead I wanna push this out as a webhook or dump this to Amazon S3 at a regular basis. By scheduling this out, I can quickly and easily get data in front of people in their existing workflows without their having to necessarily log into the Looker platform. Now, if they do have a login, they'll be able to jump back into this context and start interacting and drilling with the data just like we saw before. One of my favorite ways to use the scheduling feature is actually as an alert. I can set this up to run really often, as often as every five minutes and only between business hours or all the time. And I can have it only return results if there actually are results and if they've changed since the last run. So for example, for this e-commerce business, if I wanted to track inventory or if I wanted to track new user signups and we fell below or above a certain threshold that I wanted to pay attention to, I could schedule this out to only send me an email if certain conditions are being met and have that come directly to me or even push a text to my phone directly. Now that we've spent some time exploring and sharing this data as our end users might, let's start customizing the model and see the benefits of building in on this logic and having it become usable for an end user. So we'll go to the develop menu and select the project we've been working on. Keep in mind that LookML is not something that your end users are going to have to work in or even know exists. This is just what writes the SQL on their behalf and allows them to have a really flexible, efficient experience exploring data within Looker. As our first custom field, why don't we start thinking a little bit about our users? We have a first name field and we have a last name field, but realistically, we're gonna to wanna to see these things done together. So we'll create a new dimension and just call it name. Now the definition of this field is not just gonna to point to an underlying field like some of the ones we've seen before, it's actually gonna draw from logic of two subfields. So for example here, we're gonna take first name and we're gonna concatenate that with a space 
and last name. In this SQL bar here, I'm really just writing SQL that my database responds to. In this case, we're writing to Amazon Redshift so I can use this concat operator and other dialects I might write concat or a different function. This allows you to completely utilize the features that exist in your database without losing those and being dependent upon an engine that we would provide. So I'll click save and I'm gonna run a validator that's gonna make sure that all my references look good. It looks like we're okay. Now, why did I use this substitution operator instead of the one we have here referencing these raw underlying fields? In this case, if I were to start customizing the definition of first name, for example, if I only wanted to return the first letter or if I wanted to just capitalize the first letter of the name, I would apply that function here. And now when I go through and reference that in Redshift, it's gonna recycle that logic and I won't have to write it again. This is a really simple example, but you can imagine that as you start to build upon this model, you're gonna have changes that build on each other and you're not gonna to wanna to have to keep going back through and rewriting a knit cap everywhere you reference name. Let's do another example. Let's actually add a new measure, which is going to be the total of sale price that we've sold. So I'll give this a name again and we'll say, I wanna have total sales price be offered as a new metric. This is going to be a type sum. And I'll define this as pointing to the underlying sale price field I have available. The last thing I'll specify is drill fields. We saw drill fields before where we clicked into data and saw things underlying it. This was a randomly generated list of things that we saw before. Let's actually specify what we want to see when we click into total sales price. In this case, I'm going to want to see the ID of the inventory item. I'm going to want to see the ID of the order. I want to see user ID. And let's also reference that new field we created, user's name. Let's jump back into our explore section. Now when I expand these, we'll see that the new fields I've created exist within this field picker. So if I select name, for example, that's available here, indistinguishable from any other field. And we can see that the definition of that is taking a knit cap of user's first name, concatenating that, placing a space between, and referencing user's last name. So we still have visibility into exactly what Looker is generating behind the seams. Let's see this broken down by the total sales price these individuals have sold. So we can see total sales price appears here under order items. And we can also see that Looker is making this necessary join out to users in order to write this query. So let's give it a run. Now by sorting on this column, we can see the highest sales price for a given user's name is John Smith. Perhaps we have a couple John Smiths here, so let's actually count these out. So now if I want to drill in and utilize that drill path that we defined in the LookML section, all I have to do is click on this value and I'll be able to see the orders and the details about them that I specified of Edward Hausman. Let's create a query that tracks our top 10 users for the past 30 days. So we'll say only show me orders that were created in the past 30 days. I'll add user ID so that we're deduping our users, but I'll hide that from the query so it doesn't necessarily appear when I'm looking at it and we can compare total sales price to user's count. Perfect, let's uncombine these axes so we can see the different values. Now that I'm happy with this visualization, let's actually add it to a dashboard. So similar to before, we'll save this new query and say top users by sale price, save it into my personal workspace once again, and let's actually add this onto a dashboard. To add this to a dashboard, I can either you select an existing one or create a brand new one. Let's go ahead and make a new one called New Dashboard and click Add. To jump there, I'll just click the link and I'll be able to start building up something that others will be able to interact with. Let's add one other look, Orders by Status. And now I can simply drag around the different tiles on my dashboard to make them fit nicely. I can also quickly and easily add a filter to this dashboard. In both cases, we're filtering down to the past 30 days, but if I wanna make this dynamic, I'll just add a new filter called date. I'll set the default to be 30, and I'll tell it what to put in the where clause of each of these. Having added that, I'll now have this filter appear at the top of my dashboard, and if I just wanna look at the past 14 days, I can quickly interact with that. This dashboard, just like anything else in Looker, can quickly and easily be shared with other users by grabbing the URL, or I can also schedule this out as a PDF or as an inline set of visualizations if I want to get this in front of somebody who doesn't have a Looker login.
Thanks for watching our demo. I hope you saw the fresh new approach we're taking to analytics. There's a lot more we'd love to show you. So send us an email or give us a call and we'd be delighted to set you up with a more in-depth demo or set you up with a free trial on your own data.